share my screen and on my screen it says disabled people. Uh, so I'll let us sit with that terminology for a little minute. Uh, but the plan is to have a little discussion on the front end, do an activity together. I'll give a mini lecture and then we'll on the back end have a robust Q&A. And so once again, I'm Zebediah Hall. I am currently the Director of Student Disability Services at Cornell University. I also sit on the board for Head Association Higher Education and Disability as the Equity Officer. And some may know I was newly appointed to the Coalition for Disability for Access for Health Science. Uh, so I also sit on the board for that as well. Uh, but that's least important right now. NAS is going to help me out a little bit. Like I said on the screen, currently I'm sharing it. It says disabled people. Um, you can put it in the chat. You can unmute yourself and speak, but just really want to have a discussion with us as a group of when you hear the term disabled people or you see it on the screen, disabled people, or you engage with disabled people, what comes to mind? And please feel free to unmute yourself and interact. Please feel free to put it in the chat. I know Naz will be watching the chat as well. But when you see disabled people on the screen, you hear disabled people, you engage with disabled people. What comes to mind? I would say pride. Okay. okay. Others, just go ahead and jump in. I say people who are able who just need a little help. Mm, okay. Okay. I see visible disabilities, i.e. wheelchair, environmental and cultural that disabled people who should otherwise have equal access, diversity. Okay, okay. Keep it going. I wanna just have this on the front end. Keep the co comments coming in the chat. While we're doing that, I'm gonna ask for 10 volunteers. If so if 10 volunteers could put their email in the chat, Naz is actually gonna send you an email in real time. And so um, we'll engage in activity. I'll keep reading some of the stuff in the chat. I see not using first person experience, the person of the phrase, this is not desirable or appreciated, need access, people second, differently able. Those are all really good things. But if I can have 10 volunteers now, put their email in the chat. Naz will send you an email in real time and then I'll give you further instructions on the activity after that. Now they're gonna come in really fast. It'll be hard for her to <laughs> catch up. Okay. Anybody else, any thoughts, comments? Do anybody wanna unmute themselves? Naz, when you sent that e those emails to those individuals, just send me those names in the private chat. What else comes to mind? Disabled people. Any thoughts? Anybody want to unmute themselves and speak up at all or keep putting things in the chat? By the way, when Naz send you those emails, please do not open those emails. Okay. Glenn and Mitchell, you were the two that are actually going to receive the email. The other eight people that put their email in the chat, if you can get out a piece of paper and a pencil that will be really, really helpful. For Glenn and Mitchell, you're gonna receive an email. Please don't open that email, but I need to know which one of you are going to speak first. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this time. But out of Glenn and Mitchell, which one of you will speak first? I'll take it, Glenn. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Glenn and Mitchell, do you have those that email yet? Yep. Okay, and who said they're speaking first? Mitchell, did you say you're speaking first? Yep. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give Mitchell and Glenn two minutes apiece to describe the picture that they received. The other eight people that have a piece of paper and pencil are gonna draw exactly what Mitchell and Glenn are talking about. Glenn, when it's your time to describe the picture, I will prompt you to open that email. Don't open it yet. Mitchell, you can go ahead and open that email. Once Mitchell speaks for two minutes describing that picture, Glenn's going to speak for two minutes describing that picture. And for the eight people that are drawing, I'm going to give you two minutes to, together 
to actually, um, I'm gonna give you two minutes together to ask any questions that you have. Mitchell, if you wanna go ahead and get started. Okay, great. A church on a river, mountains behind, fall trees surrounding, evergreens, ducks near a boat on the river, a small bridge, front of the church, stained glass windows in the church, colorful flowers along the edge of the riverbank, birds flying in the sky, high clouds. That's about... You, you have a minute and 30 seconds left. You're doing an amazing okay, yep. job. Two more things, a lamppost to the right of the church. And next to that lamppost, a white fence. Okay. Just when I thought I had everything. <laughs> Any other details in that picture that you want to give? You have a minute and 10 seconds. Any details? Red flowers, orange flowers, white flowers, blue flowers, pink flowers, purple flowers. The ducks on the pond are male mallards. A brown roof on the church with a stuccoed exterior. The boat on the river is wooden. The fence is wooden. The bridge is stone. Twenty seconds. Any final details? Uh, where is Waldo? But I don't know what Waldo is. Uh, I. I don't think snow on the top of the mountains in the distance. Okay, Mitchell, your time is up. I am going to transition to the next person. Is that me, Zebediah? Yep. Okay, so uh, there's um, a church right over a bridge, which is, uh, has a water like river uh, under it. And there's a canoe nearby with two ducks on the right side of the river. Um, next to the canoe are bushes of flowers, all different kinds of colors. I'm assuming you don't all have crayons and <laughs> things like that, but, and to the right of that is a white uh, wooden fence uh, leading up to the church and behind the church and the fence are a bunch of trees that are in fall colors. Um, and if we go to the left side of the church, uh, there's a few mountains um, with tons of trees to the left side, more flowers and bushes on the left side of the river. Um, and if you want on your church, you can paint or you can draw stained glass windows. Uh, and, oh, I forgot, um, um, on the right side of the bridge, uh, there's also a lantern. Um, how much more time do I have? You have 15 seconds and you're doing an amazing job. Okay. If you really want to be specific with the bridge, there's like two uh, gate, wait, and it's not a gate, but I don't know what it is, like holes that the canoe can go through. Um, it looks like it's brick. 
your time is up. Thank you for that. For the eight people that are actually drawing and head out a piece of paper, you have two minutes together to ask those two individuals any questions that you have. Any clarifying questions about what you're drawing? Nazalie, you said the bridge was stone, not wood. The bridge is stone. Did I hear there's one duck or are there multiple ducks? There's two. So, Badiah, we're not getting graded on our drawing, are we? <laughs> that will be up to Mitchell and Naz. I'm not in charge. I'm just facilitating. <laughs> we have about 45 seconds. Any other questions for clarification? I thought I heard, I'm sorry, was it Mitchell who spoke to begin with? I thought I heard Mitchell say they were evergreen trees and Nasley say they were trees with fall foliage. Can we have some clarification on that? Yes, they're evergreen trees on the left side of the image and fall foliage on the right. Okay. I'm not good at tree types. <laughs> I have about 15 seconds. Any last questions? Is there a, a cross on the top of the church that makes you realize it's a church and not a synagogue? It's not, it's not distinguishable, but is it there, looks like a church. Is there a, a, what do they call that on the top of a mosque? The, it's not that. Not, no, not, 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 to, like... not, not to interrupt, but your time is up. Rebecca, I can give you a 30 second extended time accommodation for NAS to answer that if you would like. <laughs> no, we're, our time is up. Thanks, Bill. It's a minaret. I have, my, my, my brain was failing me on that. Thank you. Okay. Just really quick, let's unpack what we just all experienced together. Starting with Mitchell and Naz, can you tell me what that experience was like to engage with your peers in the audience about describing that picture? What was your experience? It was difficult. <laughs> okay. I felt like I was being graded. Uh, it's a decorative image, so it's not exactly an image. Well, it seemed very decorative to me, so it doesn't seem like an image that I would try and describe uh, in my day to day job uh, as extensively as I described it just now. So that was definitely a challenge. But like, again, like, where's Waldo? And Waldo was not there. Okay. What about you, Nath? Uh, it is challenging. You have to think about uh, it's such a beautiful picture. And I don't feel like I gave it justice, but I tried to provide as much detail about the location, position, um, color, um, and, and placement of all, of all of the things in this serene uh, painting. Okay. What about the eight individuals that were actually drawing and had a piece of paper and pencil? What was your experience like? Fear that you're gonna make me show you my picture. Okay. And I know that we have artists on the line here. <laughs> what about others? I, I found it to be like um, drinking from a fire hose. And there's like so much information. I'm trying to get it all down. And then I'm realizing like, oh, this is over on the right side. And oh, this is over on the left side. And I'm not sure where exactly if I'm writing, drawing in the right spaces and, and that. Okay. Any others want to comment at all that we're drawing? I was confused with the river and the pond. Okay. But I think my drawing was pretty well balanced. I don't know. I didn't find it that stressful, but maybe I've done this. I've kind of done this before. So I think that maybe previous experience of drawing from kind of like memory, you almost need to remember what they said and then keep drawing what you were drawing. It was, does that make sense to anyone? It makes absolute sense to me. Yeah, so it's like, okay, they said a church, so I'm drawing the church. Okay, now I have to remember that there are trees to the right. So that's where I think that I, I knew to like, not that I knew, but I felt that I needed to draw what was previously said and then keep trying to remember what was coming forward. <laughs> if that makes sense. Super talented, I would just say. Oh, stop. 
<laughs> what about <laughs> others? What about others? It says, remind me of my audio description assignment during my disability studies grad work. Any other comments before I dissect that activity a little bit? What about the people that were actually watching and was not participating or just engaging in the space? What were your thoughts? Anybody had any thoughts from that? Hi, it's Jacqueline Montgomery. Um, my, my thought that it, it, it was it was getting frustrating because I wasn't sure what they were, you know, like what they were really saying. And then I'm like, wow, what happened? What's on the left? What's on the right? I, I don't have access to it. So it was kind of, um, it was kind of frustrating in a sense, yeah. Yeah, one, one thing to think about, right? Um, that was a terrible activity to do, right? That's the first thing, right? The activity by design was terrible. Um, if we had anybody that was visually impaired, it would have been really tough for them to participate. If anybody had a really bad processing disorder, it would have been really hard to participate because everything was on a timer. If anybody had really bad anxiety and I put them on the spot to now have to articulate this information in front of people, that would have been really tough for them to do. I think it was Rebecca that said, are you going to grade us on this? Right. And then some people talked about the information overload. All of those things are to be true. And my point of doing that activity is how many times do we step in the classroom as faculty members and we just start teaching that way without realizing that by design, that was very exclusive. How many times do our processes and our procedures within our offices make students feel that way? I asked you to get out a piece of paper and a pencil and then Naz and Mitchell start to talk about colors. How many times have our students come into our office and they're not equipped to have conversation around disability and access? Does that show up in our processes and our procedure? What about somebody also articulated that I was trying to work off memory? Well, this is all based off your mental model. And the only way that you can draw what Mitchell and Naz was talking about, if you had similar experiences, exposure, education, or you wouldn't even been able to participate and draw those things. That's why language is also so important as we engage. Now that we know that there was a terrible activity by design, where do you think this shows up in your processes, in your procedures, or when you're teaching in your classroom? Does this show up? Sometimes I think about the individual students that when people were starting to say that they got frustrated, they started to shut down and they didn't happen. Somebody asked, was it a synagogue or was it a church? And then I think about my students that might be atheists. And now that we're doing an activity around church, how does that make them shut down and feel that as if they cannot engage in this activity? I'm gonna stop talking for a minute or two. Any thoughts of how this kind of activity or this kind of design shows up and it makes barriers for people to participate? Any thoughts now that I have framed it in that way of being a bad design of an activity, how exclusive it was? Any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, it, it makes me think of um, kind of this expectation that I think we have, especially in higher ed, that there is this uh, baseline knowledge that everybody has when they come into an environment, whether it's a classroom or an office. Um, and sometimes we might use certain vocabulary or just assume that something is, is known, right? And so what can we do to kind of challenge our own assumptions as to, well, hang on, why am I considering this as baseline knowledge? Like, why, why am I thinking this way? Like, what is my mental model? Um, and then also thinking, okay, and where's the access issue in that? How do I address that? Um, so that's kind of what it makes me think of. Yeah, thank you for that, Sarah. What about others? Any thoughts? I see it's some stuff going on in the chat. Naz, did you want to say any of the stuff that's going on in the chat? Yeah, sure. Uh, great uh, uh, comment here. You could have set expectations and provided some background about what was going to be asked and what, what, what the goal was. I think this is a great activity to share about diversity awareness. I want to borrow. <laughs> Um, now that I know you're not judging me, I am willing to share more. And that's a lesson too. Uh, I didn't know what the goal of the visualization was, so could not focus on which part was important for the questions that would follow. 
I try to envision and draw it for myself, but I didn't feel the stress of the people drawing because I won't have to show my drawing to anyone. Uh, overwhelming amount of auditory information. I would just say too, thank, thank you for reading that too. Uh, I also think about my instructionals are very vague. I think about my students that are on the autistic spectrum and sometimes they're frustrated and they have an outburst because they only wanna follow instructions that the faculty member said, you need to do it like this. But my instructions were so vague, so I wasn't concrete on where they were supposed to go and how they were supposed to handle those situations. Other thoughts as we're unpacking this a little bit more, I see Glenn having uh, his hand up. Glenn, you want to jump in? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to come back to, and I, I'm sorry, I don't recall who said it, but somebody said that they they felt like the audio description was coming at them like a fire hose. Um, you know, and as, as somebody who uh, the image wouldn't be accessible to begin with, um, that audio description coming like a, a fire hose was in, incredibly helpful in understanding, uh, you know, what was going on. So I, I think, you know, really trying to center everyone's perspective is, is the key takeaway for me here. Definitely. I think too, if we're using it in different contexts, I think if we wanted to talk about language, you could have a whole, use that activity and talk specifically about language because your language had to have some similarities. And I think about that a lot because reading is based off exposure, right? I can give you guys a subset of words that you know the definitions to, but if I write the paragraph a certain way, you might not be able to comprehend that, right? And how do those things show up? And I appreciate you saying that, Glenn. Any other thoughts before I jump into the other pieces as well? Uh, I think the activity can be done in a really well way, but make sure we just unpacking that the purpose was to do bad design, but you can't actually do that activity in a real way. But I just wanted to promote the bad design because we do it so much without thinking about it. Zebediah, there's a really great comment uh, on here as well. Like it was hard to trust you after you made a request that assumed people's sightedness, hand mobility, et cetera, really made me think about how we need to trust to learn super, super important, right? It's kind of like if you're gonna invite people over to dinner, right? You hope that they can eat something off your dinner table with all the different allergies or food accommodations that they might need. And that's the way that I try to think about it. But what I noticed is the reason I like to do it is because that very reason, that very shock, that very, wait, I can't participate. Wait, what's going on? That's some people everyday lives by the way that we design things. I think Glenn gave a really great point of how the audio description for him was really rich and gave him access in a way that a pitcher would never be able to do. Those are the things and the complexities that we're dealing with at a really high level a lot of the time. And how are we taking those things into consideration? I'm going to share my screen a little bit. I'll give some content. I'll tell you now as I give this content, I'm probably going to get a little excited. Um, I'm really passionate about this work. Uh, please, while I give the content, uh, write things down in the chat. Naz will keep up with those things. And then on the end, we'll have a discussion on the back end. As I start to share my screen, let's take 30 seconds to de-stress and re regroup, and then I'll get into the content a little bit. On the screen, I now have disabled people back on the screen. Any thoughts since we did that activity or any other comments that people want to make as it relates to hearing disabled people, seeing disabled people, or engaging with disabled people? Any other thoughts now that we did that activity? If, if you have thoughts, just hold them. Um, intersectionality flirts with inclusion and belonging to deconstruct ableism. On the screen right now, there is a little boy that has his middle finger up. Any thoughts of why this little boy will have his middle finger up? I know that there's a lot going on in our world right now, but the little boy has his middle finger up. Any thoughts about that? Looks like he has a bruise. He hurt his middle finger, showing off a boo-boo. Okay. I just really love this crowd already. I just, I'm giving air hugs and people don't even know it. Uh, he he could have learned it. Yeah, he go ahead. learned it from watching adults following someone. He's looking at his finger. Okay. So uh, what, what, go ahead. Say the last one. 
sorry, pre-verbal Tourette's. Yeah. So what actually happened is this little boy slammed his finger in the door and the teacher said, which finger did it slam? So I appreciate some of those answers on the front end. But as we go through this content, let's try to check our assumptions in the door. As much as we cannot do this as human, let's try not to stereotype people. Understand that all of us being in space and time right now, regardless of our situation, are very privileged to be at this conversation, to have this conversation and be in space and time. Are we in this space for answers versus questions or are we in here for questions that spark more answers to deconstruct ableism? Silence versus violence, all of these things are a failure to engage, which are then threats to healthy communication. Why is that so important? Because our starting point is progress towards equity is dependent first and foremost on the acknowledgement that ableism exists in schools. How do we critically reflect that negative cultural attitudes towards disability can undermine opportunities for all students to participate fully in school and society? That happens at Cornell University, that happens at your university. The negative cultural attitudes towards disability can undermine opportunities for all students to participate fully in school and society. I am a firm believer that a disabled person engages with access barriers because their environment by design does not give them access and opportunity to participate. By the way that I designed that activity, if an individual was in the space that was blind, they could not participate. It has nothing to do with them being blind. It has everything to do with the way that I designed that activity. If I build a building right now and it has a second or third floor, I don't put an elevator, stairs, or escalator, we have now became disabled to access the second and third floor and those opportunities. It is not the individual. It is the environment. It is the design. Ableism is discrimination in favor of able-bodied people. I think it's important that we start to rise this conversational ableism in the same breath that we would talk about sexism, racism, and any other ism. I think we need to rise that conversation. Right now, you're looking at a slide that I did not send, so I do want to apologize. I'll read this slide, but I added the next three slides in. This slide at the top says intersectionality. It then has uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who created and came up with the framework of intersectionality. It also says a person's social and political identity is combined to create aspects of discrimination and privilege. And then under there, I have Black women. One of the things that Kimberly Crenshaw was doing when she created intersectionality, it's not just about all of our identities, it's about all of our identities that are most vulnerable within that current social construct, or which one of our identities are privileged within that social construct. And that's what intersectionality is really getting at. What identities of yours within that space show up that make you vulnerable? What identities of yours in that space show up that make you have privilege? That's what intersectionality is talking about. When we talk about disability justice and Patty Barnes and Mia Mingus and Stacey Milburn, Leroy Moore, Eli Clare, Sebastian Margaret, when we start to unpack disability justice, this is also a new slide. Disability justice was built because the disability rights movement and disability studies do not inherently centralize the needs and experience of folks experiencing intersectionality oppression, such as disabled people of color, immigrants with disabilities, queers with disabilities, trans and gender non-conforming people with disabilities, people with disabilities who are houseless, people with disabilities who are incarcerated, people with disabilities who had their ancestral lands stolen, amongst others. Disability justice recognized the intersecting legacies of white supremacy, colonial capitalism, gender oppression and ableism is understanding how people's bodies and minds are labeled deviant, unproductive, disposable, or invalid. That's what disability justice is at its core. There's 10 principles. This is also a new slide. I put the 10 principles of disability justice up here because it's really, really important. And I don't know if people understand this framework, but the first principle of disability justice is intersectionality. What it's trying to do is say we are whole individuals. And how do we take care of the whole individual and not just make them their diagnosis or not just make them one of their other identities? Leadership of those most impacted. How do we give the disabled community the ability to lead in this space? Anti-capitalism, right? Commitment to the cross-movement organ organizing. That's super, super important. Recognizing wholeness, sustainability, commitment to cross-disability solidarity, interdependence, collective access, 
and collective liberation. Those are the 10 principles. Why is that so important? Because at our institution, we have issue of power. The faculty member has power over the student. The dean has faculty member over that. The president has faculty, uh, power over that. And then us in the disability office have power over determining accommodations. I think it's really important that we think about intersectionality because it plays out differently on campuses. I work at Cornell University, which is an Ivy League institution. So ableism sometimes is connected to racism. Ableism sometimes is connected to sexism. If I'm talking to a historically black college, maybe it's ableism connected to classism. That's why the intersectionality is so important, especially when we're talking about ableism. What construct are you in? How is that connecting back to white supremacy? And how are we actually unpacking that? Because that's where the intersectionality happens. And that's when the marginalization of identity starts to happen. I think what's really, really important as we do this work, we start to understand the historical context because sometimes we don't understand that. For religions, not all, but for certain religions that have sinned, it was looked at as a sin to be disabled. They actually dropped babies off the balcony to die. People with disability, disabled people was abandoned and left in the street. The word handicap actually comes from an individual having their cap in their hand, begging for money. Handicap is such a derogatory term. No difference than the N word is derogatory towards me. I'm not saying it's monolithic. It's not one and the same, but it's oppressive. Disabled people actually went to jail. They created freak shows for disabled people and that's the only way that they made money at times. And the rich actually paid them and laughed at them because of their disability. These things are highly important because we don't want those things to play out anymore. Early on in the textbooks, it was physicians' job to monitor and control and fix and cure. Disabled people were required to obey and submit to the treatment that they deemed appropriate. I think that's really important because at Cornell University, we no longer medicalizes our process. We understand historically what has happened to black and brown bodies. We also understand historically what has happened to women. And the last thing we wanna do is medicalize a process for a student to receive accommodations. Why is that so important? In 1880, people who spoke English as a second language was considered disabled. So for all my Europeans, brothers and sisters that did not come over and speak in English, you were considered disabled. Your pale skin gave you the ability to assimilate in such a way that others cannot. Not that they even would, would want to simulate. Poor people were considered disabled. Prostitutes, and I would say sex workers now, but if we're talking about the 1880s, it was called prostitutes. Prostitutes were considered disabled. I also told you that back then, if you were considered disabled, you were monitored, controlled, fixed, and cured. In the 1880s, only men could be physicians. Can you imagine what they were doing to those prostitutes? It's important that we understand this historical context. Immigrants considered disabled. Slaves and free slaves was considered disabled. As a slave, if you ran away from your plantation, they classified you as having a mental health condition. We also learned that disabled people went to jail. It's important to understand this historical context. I'm not saying we're dropping babies off the balcony to die, but if we're at our institution not given access and opportunity for disabled people to participate, we're distorting their lives. I also brought up eugenics because sometimes people don't know that Hitler got eugenics from America. And when we're talking about the disabled community, we got to be careful about the well-born of good origin and breeding. We don't want to scientifically be improving a race, right? In 1906, we had an American Breeder Association and race betterment development. Right? In 1911, we had a eugenics office in America. In 1928, we we're teaching this in our universities. And in 1977, if your IQ test was under 70, in the state of North Carolina, you were sterilized and unable to have a kid. Are we sterilizing our disabled students on our campuses? Are we sterilizing their opportunities to participate? We must know this historical context so it doesn't repeat itself. When we're talking about ableist microaggression, think about what happens from a denial of identity. Think about the avoidance for separateness that actually happens. How many times do our faculty members want to pat themselves on the back because they gave access to a student that should already had access to? 
that's helpless for secondary gain. Don't give access to a disabled person and put pat yourself on the back and feel like you're uh, a, a model, model citizen. They should already had access and they shouldn't need to come to you to receive that access. Let's not desexualize these individuals, right? Every time a student has to come to my office to receive an accommodation, that's a denial of their privacy because they have to come to my office to disclose this information to receive an accommodation. How are we making sure we're not patronizing these individuals? What about the spread effect that goes on on our campuses from, well, if we do this accommodations Zebediah for this student, we have to do it for all students, right? COVID really showed us what the spread effect is really about. And every time a student has to come to my office to receive accommodations, you're treating that student like a second class citizen and you're putting a burden on that student for them to have access and opportunity to participate. I tell my staff all the time at Cornell, I wish I didn't have a job. Not that I don't wanna work, but if I have a job, that means students still don't have access to participate without a denial of privacy, without being treated like second-class citizens. What does that re equate to? Treatment, exploitation, experimentation, sterilization. Well, Zebediah, we can't accommodate them like that because at this institution, we don't do that. Institutionalization is happening at a very high level at our institution. On the screen now, I put some language out of the uh, ADA in section 504. What I really wanted to do was highlight that last bullet point that talks about, however, some conditions may be the results of physical, environmental, cultural, and economic characteristics that are not impairments. Newsflash, that's us in this space. That's Cornell University, that's your university, that's your policies, that's your procedures, that's the way that you do your syllabi. All of those things are at play. Another thing that I put up here on the right-hand side is major life activity, walking, seeing, hearing, learning, speaking, breathing, standing, lifting, eating, thinking, caring for oneself. This is not an exhaustive list, but if those things are compromised, we can put accommodations in place. Also, the New York human rights law give us the ability to put in temporary accommodations if need be, right? How do we start to think about the 504 and the 88 outside of the context of the law and start to reframe that perspective, okay? When you think about the 504 and 88, the dominant narrative is has a physical and mental impairment that substantially limits one or more li major life activities, has a record of such or impair an impairment, or is regarded as having such an impairment. How about we leave that to the wayside and say the loss or limitation of opportunities to take part in society on an equal level with others is due to social and environmental barriers. It's not that individual, right? When we start to talk about intersectionality, one of the things that's really, really important is starting to see what are some of the things that were at play. Intersectionality leading up to rights for disabled people. 1964, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, 1968, the Fair Housing Act was so important to the disabled community. I put this on here and I know it's after 1973, but I put 1984, because I don't know how many people understand that there was a voting accessibility for elderly and handicapped. I wish it didn't say handicapped, but there was a voting accessibility uh, act for, for individuals with disability and elderly. What does that mean for us? What it means is that in 1973, the Rehabilitation Act of Section 504 came out. In 1990, the America with Disability Act came out. It wasn't until 2008 that the amendment of the ADA came out. In 1990, when the ADA came out, it will go to the court system sometimes and they will focus on if an individual had a disability. They were never focused on if that entity discriminated or not. The amendment of 2008 gave individuals the ability to focus on if the entity discriminated or not, not trying to prove if somebody has a disability. In 2010, the standards came out of the ADA. In 2016, the final rule came out that broadened the definition of disability. And it also talks about the individuals, when you're talking about major life function, shouldn't necessarily have to prove it medically, scientifically to receive accommodations. Why is that important? Because if we're doing civil rights for social justice, I'm looking for negative attitudes. I'm looking for social exclusion. I'm looking for design exclusion. I'm looking at systematic barriers. When people come to me and say, Zebedee, who's your first audience? My first audience is Cornell University, way before it's a student. 
right? Because I want Cornell University to understand access and opportunity to participate. So Cornell, the policies, the procedures, the things that we do are highly important, especially during these times during COVID as we prepare of what the fall may look like on our campuses. So what does that mean? Right now, sometimes people think about disability from a standpoint is due to physiological difference or impairment. An individual is at the deficit, must be cured, pity, or go to student disability service to be accommodated because we don't do that here. Disabled by design, by impairment. Access is medical, charity, or courses of a value will accommodate the student because it's the law. That's the dominant narrative. How do we change the narrative to this emerging construct? The environment disabled people with impairment. Environment must be redesigned or reconceptualized. Disabled by design, not by impairment, but disabled by design. The way I designed that activity on the front end was disabling. It had nothing to do with the individuals within the space. Access is a right. How do we uplift disability studies, civil rights, and social justice? How does that play out a little bit more complexly or a little bit more simplistically, depending on what end of the spectrum that you're on in the topic? The person is disabled by their difference or impairment? No. How about a social justice narrative? The person is disabled by the environmental barriers, lack of access. The focus is on what the person cannot do versus the focus being on what the person cannot access based off design. The problem exists within the person. I doubt it. I know that it doesn't. The problem exists with us in society. Disabled people need help, charity, and specialists. They really need access to participate. The re remedy is not rehabilitation, fixing, overcoming impairments, becoming more normal. I don't even know what normal is. Removing barriers, creating access and inclusion. We gotta be careful as we think through this stuff, right? Because the problem of dis disability is solved by a doctor, counselor, or DS professional only means that anyone can't create access. And that's what we actually should be going for is that anyone can create the access. It shouldn't have to wait for me as the director of disability. We shouldn't have to wait for the people in our field to do it. A faculty member can create access. A staff member can create access. They don't need a doctor, counselor, or a DS professional to do those things. I put this up here because this is some of the stuff that we put on our website, and I think it's really, really important sometimes. Student disability services work in partnership with Cornell faculty, staff, and students to ensure that all aspects of student life are accessible, equitable, and inclusive all of individuals with disabilities. We recognize the historical and systematic disparities that exist within our healthcare system and society at large. These disparities can often have adverse and unintended consequences that further marginalize populations. We recognize that these disparities exist among our students, population, student population, and can directly affect the student's ability to provide medical documentation of a disability. We are committed to working with every student to find appropriate and creative ways of ensuring access in every aspect of their Cornell experience. Part of what my bio said is we shifted Cornell from a medical model to a social model, civil rights for social justice model. We don't require medical documentation to receive accommodations at Cornell University anymore. If you have medical documentation that enhances us to have the ability to determine your accommodations, then we will utilize that information. But you can receive accommodations at Cornell University without any medical documentation. I have experts that are on my team that can work with a student to figure out the barriers and the access that are at play. I think that's highly important. If you know that racism exists, if you know that there's health disparities and you then are saying we require medical documentation, you're automatically saying there's a subset of my students that will never be able to receive my services. Then we know culturally, it's not always easy for black and brown bodies to talk about this. We know that some of our international students and their culture can't talk about this kind of stuff. So if we're gonna require medical documentation, we also have to be okay saying that I know that there's some subset of my students that will never be able to receive my services. That's really, really important in the work that we do. You can't say you do a social model, but then you require medical documentation. Access and inclusion may be proactively designed 
And so what we're trying to do with that message that I read to you is when students go to our website, they see that they can still receive accommodation if they don't have medical information or they can't get to a clinical provider. A creative alternative outside of the norm. A matter of shifting values, behaviors, beliefs, attitudes in or levels of awareness. So on our website, there's two steps to, to engage with our office. Do a disclosure and meet with one of our individuals within our office. That's our process. And then from there, we'll figure out what we need to do next. The reason that matters is because our standard accommodation, a starting point, but often not a necessity. Accommodations have disability awareness, but not environmental understanding. And so are they gonna keep sending the students to student disability services to receive accommodations? Or are they gonna put a little bit of universal design within their process and maybe that student doesn't need to come to my office to receive accommodations? I'm very clear on what's important to us in our office. I'm very clear we're here to be serving leaders, but that's focused primarily on the growth and well being of disabled people within the community to deconstruct ableism. We're here to be collaborators. I will be the first to say that. We value a collaborative process with disabled people having the most relevant viewpoint or information to decide how to create access and opportunity to participate. What I mean by that is I can have medical documentation, I can read that, but only that student or that person knows how their disability affects them within that environment. I need to listen to that student, that person, that disabled person, and let their, let their engagement be the most important, okay? I'm here to be a change agent. I am so clear on that. I don't know if people know this by the presentation so far, I'm here to be a change agent. I do not want to do status quo work. Status quo work does not allow my students to have access to participate. I am clear on those things. I am here to be a change agent, promote and enable change to happen as we work towards access and opportunity for disabled people to participate without needing to request an accommodation. I have a clear vision on that. I'm patient, but I'm yet very persistent. I'm gonna ask really, really tough questions to faculty, to staff, to our leadership. I'm knowledgeable and I'm gonna lead by example, but I think it's so important that I build really, really strong relationships that's built on trust. I know somebody mentioned when we started that activity, it might be hard to trust me, All right? Those things are so, so important. And I am here to be transformational, allow disabled people to lead and create a connection that rises the level of motivation and morality in both the leaders and the follow that guide us away from ableism. Right now there, there's a picture up and there's an individual standing and there's an individual in the wheelchair and the wheelchair is laying down. Not every disability is visible. Right now at Cornell, last time I checked, I believe we're up to 4,400 students. 90% of those students have non-visible disabilities. You're not gonna always know that people need accommodations, okay? But how can we create processes that it doesn't matter because we're thinking about holistic people? For example, I know that there are certain buildings that you walk into or you come into inside of Cornell, Cornell that you come into the doors and you immediately go to a subset of stairs. And so then it's not accessible for certain individuals. And so what they would do is they would put on their website, if you need accommodations, let me know if you are in a motorized scooter or wheelchair, we'll come down and meet with you. And I was giving a presentation to those individuals, and they said, Zebedai, you're talking about all this universal design and giving access. Are you going to give us $10,000 to put an elevator in there? And I said, why do you need the elevator? They said, because the students can come up and don't, uh, that's in the motorized wheel scooters and in the wheelchairs. And I said, what about if you rethought your whole process? For example, what if you met with every student down there? And then a student that has asthma doesn't need to say, Zebedai, I had asthma. I don't need to walk those stairs to go meet. The individual that has PTSD because something has happened to them when they walk up a hallway and the staircase no longer has to take that journey up to that place that is a trigger for them. An individual that has high anxiety now don't have to go down that path because now we're meeting all students down there. Now my individual students that are in the wheelchair and motorized scooters don't feel like they're left out. It didn't cost money what it took for us to rethink, reconceptualize and redesign our process so it's more equitable. So we're thinking about inclusion. I give that as an example, because sometimes when we're thinking about universal design or we're thinking about how we can give individual access, it doesn't always cost money. Sometimes it takes us reconceptualize our processes, procedures, and how we go about our business. 
what is bias and why is that so important in this conversation? An inclination of preference either for or against an individual or group that interferes with impartial judgment. I don't know how many times we think about it, we hear, especially in our grad programs, right? There's so much bias in judgment that students don't even come and receive accommodations, even if they had accommodations in undergrad because of the culture, right? The socialization of what goes on as it relates to the disabled people in the graduate programs is an area that there's a lot of bias from the faculty, from the chairs, from the advisors, from the mentors. Socialize to prefer those that are like you. Limited interaction with those that you do not share similarities with. Most people are surprised that they have bias, yet bias is what allows us to make sense of our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Zebediah, if they need 100% extended time, why are they even in this program? And then I have to remind people, this is the same program that they got into based off the merits of your credentials that you wanted them to have. I started working with the student after they were accepted to your program. This is a qualified student, but your bias because of your design is thinking that this student is not qualified because they need accommodations based off the way that you design your process. Implicit bias, the unconscious attitudes, stereotypes, the unintentional actions, positive or negative, towards members of a group merely because of their membership in that group. Associations developed over the course of a lifetime beginning at a very early age to exposure to direct and indirect messaging. Why is that so important? We talked about it on the front end. I started that activity. It was really hard for people to trust me. How is he to direct their student disability services? And he has us doing this inaccessible activity to start off this presentation that's about ableism. This is what our disabled community are going through all the time, this level of distrust. They're gonna be resistant. They're gonna be skeptics because I'm already in a place that's not designed for me. So then we're in this waiting space. And in this waiting space, we're trying to see, are they gonna be co-creators? Can I trust these individuals? How can I engage with these individuals? Those things are really, really important. I failed to say that there's a picture on the screen there's a half circle, and then there's a brain in the middle. And then under that, there's a line that says, I to we. And then there's the thing that says, this trust on the left and trust on the right. And it's a conversation dashboard from I to we. Because what it's really talking about, are we going to do things so the disabled community can trust us? For example, we're talking about intersectionality. When that situation happened with George Floyd, on our website, we, said, we put, we stand in solidarity with the Black community. When the things happen with the Asian community, we did another similar thing on our website. That's the intersectionality because I needed my Asian students during that time to know that if they're having acute things that are going on, please come to me so I can accommodate you. Not that I needed you to go see a medical mental health provider to know that you're going through things, right? By that notion of us putting that up on our website, there's a certain level of trust that we were building and we were flirting with intersectionality because it was not just about my disability I was dealing with, but do they understand me as a black and brown person might experience this different. Me as a poor person might experience this different. That's really, really important because we're in positions to be transactional or we can be positional or we can actually be transformational and be co-creators and listen to our disabled community so they can help us create access and opportunity for them to participate. This is level setting your conversations, how to influence with intention. There's times where we're going through stuff and we need to make a decision as a staff. And I always ask my staff when they make a decision, are you gonna be transactional or is there a space for you to be transformational in that space? So next time we gotta work with that faculty member, next time we gotta work with their college, there's a better understanding and so that's more students can have access and opportunity to participate. Let's think about transformational leadership. The four eyes focused on ableism. Idealized influence, acting as a strong role model. When I came on the screen, I heard Naz giving a presentation about some of the things that people are doing from accessibility standpoint, how we're trying to pull resources together, acting as a strong role model. Do we have high standards of ethical and moral conduct in relation to access and opportunity for disabled people to participate? Are we making others want to follow universal design? 
How are we inspiring and motivating? Are we communicating high expectations for access so all can participate? I think I heard somebody said diversity includes disability. Are we inspiring others to commitment and engagement and shared vision of disability inclusion? What symbols and emotional appeal to focus on group members to achieve universal design? How are we doing these things intellectually? Are we stimulating others to be creative and innovative? Are we challenging and valuing everyone's belief to deconstruct ableism? Are we supporting disabled people? Are we trying new approaches? Are we developing innovative ways of dealing with ableist issues? Because I, I feel it coming in the fall. Vaccine required, in-person classes. Sound kind of ableist to me. Might be racist, might be sexist. All of those isms, because pre-pandemic, all of those isms exist. And I keep hearing people saying they want to go back to normal. I'm not in a rush to go back to places where people are marginalized. Can we learn from this pandemic? And can we create universal design? Can we listen carefully to the needs of the disabled people? Are we acting as allies to assist disabled people to have the platform and not speaking for others? Are we helping followers grow through personal challenge? Those things are important when we're talking about ableism. Civil rights for social justice, ableism is real and it needs to be deconstructed. Disabled people are oppressed. Claim it, say it, call it, let's go there. Let's act like disabled people are not oppressed. They are oppressed every day when they engage on our college campuses. Doing it because it's the right thing to do. How do we move away from being well adjusted to in injustices, right? There's so many times that we're so adjusted to the injustices we allow them to keep happening. Identity and environment is important. For example, sometimes if the engineering program has more males, it might be misogynistic. So if there's a woman in that program, that's the identity and might hold another identity of disability, it might astrobate in that misogynistic environment. What if there's a nursing program, right? If that nursing program has more women in there, that might be problematic for some of the males and that might astrobate their situation. What about our LGBT community at some of these religious institutions? Identity and environment. That's what intersectionality is getting at. And when are you most vulnerable in that construct based off your identities? Compliance is not enough if we're gonna do this work at a high level. We can't be change agents trying to do compliance. I can't be a change agent saying, tell me specifically in the law where it says I can do this. The law doesn't work that way. Compliance is not enough. The law is the floor. Civil rights for social justice is the ceiling. How do we break down barriers? How do we make access accessible? This is gonna take a lot of education, especially as we keep doing this work. I like to listen to and read a lot of information from Dr. Cornell West. And one of the things Dr. Cornell West would say is, you gotta let the phones be smart. We have to be wise. We have to let the computers be smart. We have to be courageous. I work at an elitist Ivy League institution. I never wanna be the smartest in the room, but I do wanna be wise and courageous to say the things that need to be said so individuals can stop being marginalized and they can have access to participate. I don't wanna be right. I want to do the right thing. That's really important in this work. How do we challenge some of the biases and injustices that are out there? Name disability explicitly. Don't say differently able. Avoid euphemisms. I can only imagine the euphemism they use for my blackness, right? That individual doesn't have special needs because we fail to give them access to participate. Physically and mentally challenged, differently able. Let's not use language like that. Name disability explicit. Let's stop telling disabled people to fit in when it wasn't designed for them. Let's make eye contact. Let's stop doing that. Whether I make eye contact with you, it doesn't, it doesn't mean I can't do my assignment. It doesn't mean I can't participate, but we put so much emphasis on that. Well, that person is giving the presentation and they haven't made eye contact. I'm gonna dock them down to a C. Was the content there? What's so important about the eye contact? 
What about a firm handshake for the people that have never met me? I'm a tiny guy, right? I'm like 140 pounds. I hate when men shake my hand really firm. Culturally, certain women shouldn't shake certain men's hand. Mobility concerns doesn't allow certain people to have a firm handshake. How many people lost job opportunities because they didn't have a firm handshake? We put so much emphasis on things that make absolutely no sense. What about time responses? Sometimes I'm asking my faculty members, are you measuring time? Are you measuring how quick they can do something? No, then why your exam time then, right? If I go through an interview process and they say, I have two minutes to respond to this question, my, answer, my question to them would be, are you looking how quickly they can do it? Or are you searching for knowledge? Because if you're searching for knowledge by putting that two minute gap, you're just seeing how quickly they can get back to the information. You're not measuring what you're actually trying to actually look for. Non-institutionalized versus institutionalized. That's really important when we talk about the prison of pipeline for some of our black and brown bodies. What does it mean for some of our disabled people when we're institutionalizing them? And bias towards people with non-visible disabilities, right? There's times where an individual walk in with a cast and we'll be quick to accommodate them. Somebody come in and say they're having some acute mental health stuff, we're gonna tell them to prove it. Bias towards people with non-visible disabilities, chronic illness, those kind of things are also at play. And I put down here job accommodation network as a resource because sometimes people don't know that that exists. And it's a way for you to think about accommodations in the workspace or maybe a tool for you to learn about certain diagnoses or ways in which you can accommodate people. As we go through this information and I start to wrap up so we can have a Q&A on the back end, uh, there's a picture up here with Judy Human and Martin Luther King Jr. The reason I put this picture up here is because I'm trying to raise ableism in the same vein as that we're raising racism, not saying that they're monolithic, not saying that they're one and the same, but Judy Human is to the disabled community what MLK is to the black community. Judy Human is one of the individuals that led individuals to do the sit-in and the marches and all of those kind of things during the section 504 1973 section 504 the rehabilitation act she was very, really instrumental into that think about disabled people not being able to get themselves off the ground while they're doing the sit-ins think about them not having a mobility to even move around it was really important i had a chance to spend some time with judy human and she talked to me about how it was lesbians that came and bathed them and washed their hair because they couldn't leave for days because they didn't have the ability to. She talked about how it was the Black Panther Party that came in and fed them when they were doing that sit-in. When we're talking about this and we're talking about intersectionality and we're talking about people being oppressed, we don't have to have the oppression of the Olympics. We have to show up for each other where we're being marginalized because it's all oppression, even if it looks different. As we think about intersectionality and flirting with inclusion and belonging to deconstruct ableism, what's going to happen is your ethics and morals might not equal up. Ethics is the rule of conduct recognized in respect to a particular class of human action or a particular group culture. For example, our institutions are going to come out and say vaccines are required. We're going to only have in-person classes. That is ethically what's going on. Morally, does that sit well with us knowing that we're gonna exclude some of our students? A person's standard of behavior or belief concerning what is or is not acceptable for them to do. We all have a moral compass inside of us. How do we make sure that our morals is not being suppressed based off the ethics that are at play, based off our leadership? As I start to close out and we get into this, discussion on the back end and I'm hoping people have thoughts and comments and really want to discuss some of the information we went over. There's some soul searching questions that I try to close out presentations with. What have I achieved? What impact have I made? How do I know I have made an impact? What evidence do I have to support this? What is the problem? How can I fix this? What am I doing differently to change the results? What is the real goal? What am I really trying to accomplish? I played college basketball. My coach used to say, don't point the finger, point the thumb, because it points back at you. For me, when I think about these soul searching questions, I try to start my day this way and end it. Um, one of the most important questions on here is how do you use power? How do you use power? It is in service of whom or what? I am because we are, okay? To get into our discussion a little bit, one of the things that I want to think about is 
Albert Einstein famously noted that problems cannot be resolved by the same level of consciousness that created them. Notice I said I want to be a change agent and I don't want to have status quo. If we are addressing our 21st century, pro century challenges with reactive mindset that mostly reflect the realities of the 19th and 20th centuries, we will increase frustration, cynicism, and anger across all four meta processes. We need to engage the need to learn to respond from a deeply generative source. As we go into this discussion, just a little bit of reflection on intersectionality. I know that all my group identities and the intersection of those identities create unique aspects of who I am and what this is true for other people too. One of the questions I want you to ponder is how do you how do our intersecting identities shape our perspectives and the ways we experience disabled people within our world? Think about that, process that a little bit. I am aware of my advantages and disadvantages. I have in society because of my membership in different identity groups, and I know how this has affected my life. How do power and privilege impact disabled people? within the institution. I'm gonna take two minutes for us to de-stress and refocus our energy. When you take those two minutes, please write down any thoughts you have, any questions that you have, anything that you think will be important for us. And then what we will do for the last minutes that we have, I think we have about 20, 25 minutes when we come back after two minutes or so. What we're gonna then do is then have a robust discussion about the activity we did, about using the terminology disabled people, about some of the information that I presented and understanding if we don't know our historical context and where intersectionality plays to help us deconstruct ableism. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, stop talking and take a drink, give people two minutes to de-stress and then we'll get back at it at 2.40. So we have 20 minutes for a discussion. Okay, now you've got some kind of like virtual campaign going to get you to speak at all Sunnis. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just say uh, I'm willing to do whatever I can and be as resourceful and as helpful uh, as I possibly can. And if time is permitting, uh, if you ask Naz, I'm really, really easy going to work with. And I just want to be helpful as much as I possibly can. As we open this back up, I would love to hear thoughts or Naz, if you want to maybe uh, read some of the stuff that was in the chat. And then if people have specific questions or anything or any comments or anything that they want to say out loud, by all means, I just want to have a 20 minutes of free flowing discussion and have conversation. There was a lot. So I'm scrolling. <laughs> before you, before you actually read that off, take some time to gather your thoughts. Does anybody want to say anything out, out, uh, unmute themselves and speak at all, by all means, please do sure, that. Sure, I'm uh, Rebecca Oling at Purchase College, and um, I, I'm interested to know, um, you mentioned a few of the voices that inspire you, but, you know, who do you follow on Twitter? What voices do you listen to? I know, Al, you know, Ally Twitter is uh, very active, and I'm wondering which voices you elevate. Yeah, I, I honestly do not have a Twitter account. Uh, I'll be honest about that. Um, but the things that have elevate me is areas in which people are being devalued. And then if people are being devalued, how do we dissect that? When you're talking about a person that I read, there's a person named Dr. Eddie Glaude. He's a department chair of African-American studies and theology at Princeton. And he has a lot of research on devaluing people. And he talks about how we devalue people at a really high level. And then there's an individual that I'll read up on sometime. His name is Dr. Strayhorn, and he talks about belonging. And part of belonging is being able to bring your whole self. And I just think about how many times our disabled community have to leave part of them 
outside to participate. And so those are two individuals that's not necessarily disability specific focus that I uh, go to and that I look up, but I try to connect those things back. And then other than that, if we're talking about it in the field, I do a lot of reading and working with Jamie Axelrod, Amanda Cross, and those kind of individuals. And so those are some people that I go to. Dr. Strayhorn, yep. He is at, he's assistant provost at Virginia Union University. It's an HBCU, but he used to be at another institution prior to that. Other thoughts, questions? I'd love to talk more about the fall, Zebediah. Thank you for that. That's very edifying. Um, you know, I'm uh, just down the road from you at Cortland in the Disability Resources Office, and uh, we're excited to have you part of our Central New York community here. Um, we are. We've felt the same way about the return to in-person classes in the fall. We're very concerned that students who have had access over the past year are going to lose that access. Um, we're concerned that the campus isn't offering enough remote classes in the fall. Um, we can't control that in our office. On the flip side, we could control accommodations, giving students access remotely to in-person classes, but there's very real concerns that that is a fundamental alteration, that it's really hard for faculty to teach that way, that no one is well served by students uh, attending remotely a class that a, a faculty member doesn't know how to teach students in person and remotely at the same time. Um, so we're kind of, we feel stuck. So where, how are you approaching this on your campus? Um, how, how are you leveraging your uh, wisdom and power in the Disability Resources Office on behalf of your students? Yeah, what, what the first thing you should know is I actually bought my house in Cortland, so uh, oh, great. I'm a lot more closer to you than you think. Uh, but to answer that question, uh, I did sit with our general counsel a little bit to have some discussions. Uh, what I know to be true, right, let's start with just some basic things, right? If there's vaccinations required and we're in person by law, it probably isn't reasonable to have all virtual options, right? from a law standpoint, but should we from a universal design standpoint and things like that? So what I'm trying to do, what are low hanging fruits that we can do? Can we still record the classes, right? If they're just straight lecture, can we just do audio recording so people can have access to that? Can we do video recording when it's more hands-on and more things that they actually need to observe? I think those things are highly important. I think what's also important is that university keeps saying vaccines are required, but we have a waiver process, right? Well, if you waive those people, we didn't have to accommodate those individuals. Who's gonna take that on? The people in the disability office, right? So one of the things that I'm starting to work with my faculty members on is, say that you have an assignment due every Thursday at 9 p.m. What's the purpose of that assignment? And once we know the purpose of that assignment, what's the four or five different ways that they can do that assignment? Because some of our students actually need the structure and they need that assignment that's due 9 p.m. Some people, depending on their condition and flare-ups, that's really problematic. So they might need to do a bigger paper or maybe three quarterly bigger papers that are smaller than a bigger paper at the end. And how can we still do that to help them think through those kind of things? I think when we're talking about the labs, right? One of the things I try to work on with the people in the labs are, is this hands-on or is this observation? Because that's two totally different things. And if it's observation, you can do that virtually. You don't have to be in a lab for us to ho hover around two students that's actually working on the project, right? Those are the kind of things that are important. I think what's also important is think about when you go in a lab. One of the questions that I sometimes ask faculty members is, do you have the students set up that lab because they have to or because that's best practice, right? Most of the time it's best practice and not that they have to. Because what's really important for that, say that I have a student that has ADHD and they set their lab up all over the place. But if they can put those chemicals together and it doesn't give a bad reaction and still give the same outcome, why are you docking them points for that, right? Because what we accommodate is essential functions, not best practices. So how do you get faculty to decipher between what's best practice and what's essential functions? And that's where the conversation around accommodations can lie. I actually have a framework that I work with faculty that it's like a four point PowerPoint slide that I could show you at one point. But what it does is actually faculty member, what are your essential functions in your program? Now that you told me what your essential functions are, what is an example of that essential function and a sample of that essential function? Now that we know that, what's the purpose of this actual assignment? For example, if you were to say that 
as a faculty member, I'm not saying that you're a faculty member, but say that you had to give a presentation. I'll ask the faculty member, what's the purpose of this oral presentation? If they say oral communication, well, the student can call in on their iPhone and do oral communication. But if they said in-person communication, that's a totally different thing. And so what we're really trying to do is what is the actual assignment and what's the purpose of it? So we can then figure out what accommodations are appropriate based off the essential functions that they should be able to tell me because the essential functions show that the student is proficient in the learning outcomes. That's how I try to engage faculty. And so what I'm trying to do now is how can we get to as many faculty members to have them thinking about universal design on the front end? Because it's also going to help them when they need grading and all those kind of things. Is how do we faculty? How do we get faculty to understand that the universal design does not only benefit the student, but it actually benefits you as well? Uh, but that's a long-winded answer to what you said. But yeah, I see Glenn hand is up, and then after Glenn Naz, I'll go to you a little bit so you can see some of the stuff that was in the chat. But I, I really um, I first want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, but I, I wanted to highlight something that you said. Um, because I, I think it, there was so much great material. I, I didn't want this to get lost. One of the things that I hear that's incredibly concerning um, is, well, we're, we're returning to normal um, or, or, you know, return to uh, what used to be. And I, I think one of the things that we really have to think about is for those who uh, the remote uh, participation, regardless of, of how that um, comes about, is more accessible. What is what is hearing that return to normal signify to that person um, who you know really had so much better access as a result of that remote uh, engagement? Yeah, and, and it's super ableist. Like you hear people saying things like, I know it's easy for you to work from home. This has nothing to do with easy. This actually gave me access to participate in a way that I never could participate. And I'm actually doing my work at a higher level. And, and, and that's my biggest fear. And that's my problem with some of our leadership that are not as in tune to ableist language are using language about it's easy. And I know that it's nice. But for to your point, Glenn, it gave access to certain individuals in a way that we never had to. I think about right now, right? We're all on Zoom right now. It's so many different universities here and we're doing this in the Zoom platform. Why would we go back to a situation now that we will have an in-person conference that only 20 universities come only because they have the budget and those kind of things, right? There's so many inequities. Take ableism off the table. There's a lot of black and brown bodies that look like me that's at these predominantly white institutions. And sometimes it's really, really tough to be in those spaces. There are some women that go into spaces right now with men that probably don't make them feel comfortable. Is there an opportunity for us to use universal design to still meet our business needs without marginalizing these individuals? Also, there's a benefit that if we can have individuals work remotely, then you might have access to a bigger talent pool. Right. It's so many benefits to all these things. And I just think that we're so quick to go back to normal that we don't realize that there are a lot of marginalized people when we went when we pre pandemic. And there's going to be a lot of marginalized people post pandemic, by the way, that we're going. One of the things that I keep trying to use to my leadership is let's make sure we don't create vaccineism. Right. What I try to tell them is if I had a picture, I would say white only, colored only vaccinated only non-vaccinated only that's where we're headed and if we're not careful we're going to create vaccineism naz you want to read some of those comments and some of the stuff that was in the chat sure thing um there's some uh compliments and comments i'm i'm feeling inspired and shamed simultaneously thank you uh there's a one that was, I can't even imagine the difference this more inclusive perspective might have made for me when I was a student needing accommodations and was told there was nothing they could do to help. We need a new paradigm that recognizes the inherent sovereignty of each individual and understands that everyone is better off when all caps, everyone is better off. Um, hold on, I'm scrolling, scrolling. Love the presentation, very powerful inclusion, learned a lot and we'll put it into practice. My son just took the AP computer science exam and there was no flexibility for him to go back and redo a question if another question helped him recall the previous info. He has no quote unquote disability and that doesn't speak to his knowledge at all. Just really quick, I've been jumped in. They, uh, they were doing that on Cornell campus as well. 
And so I literally put on the accommodation letter, you will allow this student to go back on their exam, right? Just basic test taking strategy, you go through what you know, other questions might have help you trigger answers and things like that. So we actually started to blatantly put that on the accommodation letters at Cornell that as a faculty member, you will allow the student to be able to go to question two and come back to question one as they need to. Sorry about that, Nas, go ahead. No, don't, don't apologize at all. There, there's some resources that were shared like Twitter handles and uh, the academic ableism book, uh, which is freely available in audio format and PDF. Um, there's a question. Is there data that can show remote learning was better for students? I believe the K-12 data showed students did much worse with remote learning. Wondering if there's data that can support remote modality. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but what I would just challenge is with the research that we're looking at, how did that research identify disabled people? For example, there's all the time where faculty members say, well, it's not good to take notes like that. Note taking should be done like that. And then you look at the research and you look at the participants and none of them identify as disability, right? And so that's really important when we're looking at this research to see are people actually identifying the disabled community and is the disabled community showing up in that research? Because we're so quick to say, well, overall people do this and most of the time it's exclusive of the dis disability point of view. Who paid for the research? Is that Rebecca? Were you asking that in reference to um, more? Yeah, in, in reference to the K through twelve information. You know, I'm as a librarian. I sometimes wonder who's behind the supporting some of the research and what perspective is it done from, and is it inclusive, as Zebediah was saying, of the disability community? Yeah. Um, I don't have many more questions. Just That's okay. Lots of praise. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments, questions, or anything like that? One of the things I'll say, sometimes I get questions about how do you get people to talk about some of these really touchy topics? I try to tell stories that are unrelated, and then I try to put demographics on there. So I'll tell you a story, and it can relate to Me Too. It can relate to the Black Lives Movement, accessibility, those kind of things. So say that we all live in a cul-de-sac right now, and there was a house on fire. The fire department will come into that cul-de-sac and spray water only on the house that's burning. The neighbors will come out in that cul-de-sac and say, do you need food? Do you need water? Can you guys come here? And then you will work together, right? That's an easy story for us to agree upon. There's a fire, a spray water on the house that's burning and let the community take care of that family. So if that was a black lives, the fire department could be the cops. The white lives could be the, the, the neighborhood, the people in the community. If you tell that exact same stories and you put demographics on there and then somebody has a problem with the story, that's where the tension point needs to have the conversation. If we're talking about the Me Too movement and you tell that same story and there's tension there, that's where the conversation needs to happen. If we're talking about ableists and we're telling similar stories, that's where the conversation needs to happen. And sometimes you need to get people agreeing to a point of view and then put the demographics on there so they can um, so they can see and manifest themselves of their bias or their prejudice coming out because you just agreed to, if this was a fire, we would help these individuals. Now that you said that this was a woman on fire based to the Me Too movement, now you don't wanna help and you think totally different about it. So how do we unpack this? I think it's also important when we're talking about the disabled community and other marginalized identities that we don't marginalize each other. Sometimes it's that, well, only one disabled person can lead, so I'm gonna make sure I get up there and not help others. The way that I think about it is, I'm from Chicago originally, and there's a lot of potholes in the road. And if I go and pave those potholes, I shouldn't go put holes behind me so the next person have to run into those potholes. If I pave it smooth, how do I make sure that they have a smooth transition and we're being more helpful to each other? And so I try to tell these stories in ways that don't have demographics and then later go back and put the demographics on there so we can see where people biases actually are so we can unpack that negative cultural attitude. Naz, I'll pass it back to you. If there are no other comments or anything, that's fine too, so. No, I think there's just a lot to digest um, and reflect on and think about, you know, how we use our power and, and privilege and just unpack all of this and all of the connected uh, oppressions and things. Not a problem. I'm so, so appreciative to be in this space and time. I can tell you ever since I've been here what it's been like 18 months. So most of it's been in the pandemic and my staff is like, you need to do more with New York. You need to do more with New York. And so 
uh, Nash, you know, Cyrus and Cyrus has been on my heels a lot about that. Uh, so really, really appreciative. Yes, no, we absolutely need to, to engage more. I think we have a lot to learn and, and collaborate with you and other institutions to figure out some of the things that Jeremy asked with respect to the fall and avoiding vaccinism and things like that. I think that that's a really critical next step. Yeah, I see Cynthia put in there. Uh, I sit on a national committee uh, called COVAC is for uh, ACHA, uh, college, Association College Health. Uh, what they are working on is trying to get out communication that can help people understand how to uh, engage as we move forward with this pandemic or the pandemic ending and things like that. Uh, I sit on there because I sit on the board for a head. What I'm trying to work with them on is can we create a universal design tip sheet for lack of a better term to help people dissect this. And what I mean by that, for example, you hear all the schools say, but we have a waiver process, but what happens when that waiver process happened? And then what happens to your disability office, right? And so it's those kind of things that we're not talking about. What about the institution that is not Cornell, that does not have Cornell Health and all they have is a nurse practitioner as that person. So all of that's gonna fall to them. And then you have the one person in the disability office, right? How do we then build in universal design and say, if you're gonna make it mandatory for vaccine and it's gonna be in person, maybe you should think about having virtual options or classes recorded. Like how do we build that in, in a way that it's helpful? Um, I think it's gonna be important. One of the things that I would think we really, really need to focus on is I think the science is gonna say that it's safe from a herd immunity standpoint. That science doesn't take into account psychological safety. And we have a duty to think about psychological safety because if my student can't sit in that class and learn because they're focused on their psychological safety and the mental health aspects of things, I need to accommodate them. So that's going to be really tough in my role when I need to challenge my university to accommodate this student when they're saying it's safe by science. And that's where the gray spaces are going to be for us. And that's going to be important for that psychological safety. Right. It's one thing to say that you're safe because of herd immunity and you're the only couple people that's not vaccinated, but that doesn't mean I feel safe mentally. And we have to unpack that. And that's going to be real conversations we have to have. Yeah. But we should work together, bind together. Right? We don't have to do it on our own. I think it's more powerful when I can say, well, SUNY's doing this or Cornell's doing this or we're doing, we, that's where I think there's some richness in that kind of stuff. Uh, and then Cyrus, all they talk about this group or the New York group getting together and they were really instrumental with uh, accessibility as it relates to textbooks and those kind of things. And they wrote some things and I just wonder how do we work towards those kind of same goals for the things that are happening in the fall. Yeah, I also talked to your uh, web accessibility officer. So we're we're all aligned on many fronts uh, to strengthen the digital accessibility, to you know, you know, eliminating ableism, and and uh, the fall is definitely the psychological safety piece is going to be huge. So thank you for for raising that. I didn't even think about it in that way. Uh, everyone's just saying thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you immensely, your wonderful colleague, and uh, I thank you. I, I can't say it enough. So, not a problem. I'm gonna see for hang on for five, 10 minutes. Just to, I think we're doing some stretching or yoga or something. Yes, we've been sitting all day. Okay, Victoria, I think we can stop recording. And